Welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. Join us here every Saturday night at 8 o'clock or listen to our podcast anytime on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, just to name a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first. Mary Jo Shell brought her retirement boredom to an abrupt halt by creating a work of historical fiction entitled Annabella's Story. So you weren't exactly prepared for your retirement, right? I was kind of forced to retire due to a medical condition. And I was uh, bored to tears. And um, I always liked uh, family history. But I wanted the history to be more complete. I wanted more than names and dates. Okay. Um, I wanted to know what people did, um, how they looked, um, where they lived, you know, everything. So um, I started with my mom's family um, who had, there were 10 children and 46 grandchildren. And uh, then my dad's family. And I mean, it has, it has everything. I describe all my aunts and uncles, all my cousins. Um, I even have drawings of the, their family farms, um, pictures. Um, as much information as I could get so that when you read it, you know a whole lot more than just the name. Right. You were able to to really get some good detail in there. Yes, yes, yes. Because I still had some aunts and uncles that were living. So um, um, because some of the stuff I didn't remember, um, and especially the details on the farm. But um, and then it did my personal family. There were six of us. And so it it even includes how we sat at the table when we were growing up, our neighborhood, the names of all our neighbors on the street. Um, There's like a little synopsis for everybody as far as um, where they went to school, where they went to college, what their occupation is, and, you know, so on. Um, And it took me about a year and a half to do that. And when I was finished, I went, well, that was kind of fun because I had to do a lot of research on that, too. And I thought, well... I wonder if I could write a book. You know, I'm, I'm an accountant, but I know how to write. Could I do it? And, you know, and I pondered it. And then I thought, well, I kind of put it on the back burner because I thought, I don't, what would I write about? You know, what kind, what kind of story would I write? And I was trying to find a, um, like a short vacation to go on. And I've always wanted to go on a riverboat. So I was looking at the riverboats that go down the Mississippi River mm. and the stops, and somehow Pittsburgh caught my attention, and I did a little research on Pittsburgh, and I said, that's it. It's going to be a story about the Civil War um, around Pittsburgh, Mississippi, and then it just kind of went from there. That's amazing. It was like you were led to Vicksburg. Yes, yes, because I've never been there. <laughs> Tell me about this story. The story is about Bella. She was 16 when the, when the Civil War started. Her dad and her second oldest brother uh, fighting for the Confederacy. And her older brother, Jonathan, he was already in the Army. And so he fought for the North. Um, and during the, um, the process, the, the uncle was left in charge, the great uncle, and they had a cousin and his health failed. And at the age of 18, there's Bella. All of a sudden she's responsible for the plantation. Uh. Um, and because her mom just, it, she didn't deal with it. She didn't, she didn't comprehend all this. She didn't want to deal with it. So it was up to Bella. And um, so it's just a story about how their life was, you know, after the slaves are all gone, there's just a few of them left and how they survive and what they do. And then, you know, how uh, um, Confederate soldiers come to the plantation, you know, like to stop. And then when the battle started in Pittsburgh, her brother's unit was assigned to go there. So he um, said, well, we can camp at the plantation. At least he hoped he could. Um, And so that's how she met uh, her captain. and you know, fell in love, and um, it was it was it just kind of went from there. Because then, after the siege was done, and the Union soldiers left, then the Confederate soldiers, her dad, um, 
brought soldiers back to the plantation because they were, you know, weak. They'd been under siege for 40 days. Hmm. Um, and so they walked to the plantation and then, you know, there they got to recover. Um, they all went back to the war. And so there they are again in the family, just, you know, on their own um, until the war ends and people start to come back. Um, her dad came back. He was injured. Um, the, uh, she didn't really know where her brothers were, although her father was pretty sure that, um, Andrew was dead, you know, cause it was in a battle and he didn't find him afterwards. So he assumed he was dead. Um, and then Jonathan and the captain show up, um, they're chasing outlaws, Southern, you know, um, soldiers who had turned to being outlaws. So, um, they're looking for them. And in the meantime, Andrew and his, um, group show up at the plantation and based on everything they say, the father figures out what they are doing. Um, but they didn't stay very long. Um, and just as they were about to leave, Jonathan and the soldiers show up at the plantation, not knowing that he's there, but that he's in the area. And so they kind of like cross paths um, without knowing it. And then, you know, then they follow him into town and they're robbing a bank. And, um, you know, eventually they get to this house where this guy is known to have um, all his money at the house. And so they're going to rob him, too. And that's where the final battle takes place. Um, and, you know, Andrew dies and um, and then, you know, they, they, when the Union soldiers come back, then he realizes he's going to he's going to take Bella. I'm not going to let her go again. And so they end up getting married and they're they get an assignment to do something special. So the ending you know, of the story is it, like it leaves it open that they're they'll be back, but they don't know when everybody's off on a new adventure. Are you going to continue the adventure? Um, it's it's in my thoughts. Um I started writing um, another book um, while I was waiting. It's completely different. It's about a female pirate. Um, and, you know, I researched the Caribbean. There were actually five female pirates. Um, but, you know, it's like I wasn't ready to um, continue that line of thought. It's like I needed a break from it. Okay. Um, and so I thought, okay, you know, now it's been a year, year and a half since I actually wrote it, um, now I got to figure out how to continue it. Like, I don't have a good thought about, you know, where the continuance goes. Well, you know, going from accountant to writer is a pretty big leap. How is that creatively for you? You know, the whole creative process of putting this story together, of weaving in, you know, the historical facts with the fiction based on members of your family. Yeah. How was that? How was that experience for you? Um, it was actually very challenging because when I, uh, I wrote like a few chapters, I sent it to one of my sons and said, tell me what you think. And he said, mom, I feel like I'm reading a history book. Tell me more about the characters. Hmm. And I thought, okay, I, I know what I, you know, I know what I did wrong. So then I, I must've written this, this story at least three times, right. you know, or I, I'd finish it and I'd go back and say, no, that's not right. And then they go and add some more and, um, until I was comfortable with it. Um, cause I got what he was saying, you know, don't, don't tell the history, tell about the people. Right. Um, and so it just, it was help from other people. I mean, you know, I had my family, a couple members read it, you know, and tell me what you think, you know, um, <laughs> on the the hardest part to write was the love scene he's like okay i've never done this before um how do you write it without you know being sensual enough but not like over the top i'm not going to write an x-rated story here um so I, I wrote that scene and i sent it to one of my nieces and i said tell me what you think and she goes I really like it. And I said, okay, because, you know, I was kind of lost there. <laughs> yeah, that's hard. That's very intimate stuff you're writing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So. And um, I thought, well, I know how it works, but how do you tell it? Right. So in in terms of getting getting the word out there, what have you done? Anything? Well, um, 
um, I contacted a lot of my relatives, tell them about the book, you know, and gave them where they could get it. And my brother in Chicago bought 15 copies and handed them out to all his friends. I posted it on Facebook so that friends I had there passed classmates from high school and so on. I could share it with them and all my cousins. Coming up in July, I'm having a book signing. I moved into a 55 plus community and it's extremely active and very wonderful. So they've allowed me to have a book signing in the clubhouse. Great. Yeah. So I've sent out invitations and everybody in the complex will be able to come and you know, I'm very excited about that. A little nervous because we have a book club too. And we just reviewed my book and I was very nervous about that, you know, because most of them were very avid readers. Um, and I got good reviews. Um, you know, they obviously had some comments about where they thought I could improve, you know, like in another story. And, and I was happy with that. I don't take criticism poorly. And so I thought, wow, they all liked it. That's amazing. That's great. And you're not bored anymore. Uh, no, I'm not bored anymore. <laughs> <laughs> great story. Just the story of how you came to write this book is a good story right there, Mary Jo. Yeah. Any advice for uh, authors out there who they want to write, just haven't been able to do it? Well, what I found interesting as I was going through the process um, I found that I was following the stuff I learned in high school about how to write a story without even realizing it, you know, about how, you know, writing an outline, writing like your primary ideas and then, okay, what are the sub things in that primary idea? And, um, you know, not to, not to try and think about the whole story all at once. Um, right. and just, you know, okay, what is the, what is the main thing you want to do? And then, you know, put little pieces in between, which, you know, um, but you have to let it, just let it come. I mean, I would write maybe three days, you know, consistently, and then I'd have to put it aside. You know, I got to think about this, but I would just say, be patient and, you know, don't worry about making a mistake. God, don't worry about that. No, somebody will find it for you. <laughs> Good to know, Mary Jo. <laughs> All right, listen, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me. Thank you. Born and raised in Jamaica, Diana Budhai came to the U.S. to go to college in upstate New York, where she ultimately transformed her life and hopes to inspire others to do the same with her book, Under the Jimbalid Tree, the memoir of a Jamaican girl. I came here in at the end of August to start school at Emmanuel College, and my birthday was September 24th when I turned 20. So I majored in Spanish and minored in English and uh, education because my intention was to go back home and to be a Spanish teacher. And then I was going to maybe come back and get certified as a principal and then go to Jamaica back and be a principal of a school. So that was my goal. What did you end up doing? I ended up meeting my husband-to-be, oh. and he was a Cuban national who went to Jamaica during the Cuban crisis and got stuck and was um, considered a refugee. So he couldn't travel at all. We ended up getting married after I graduated from Emmanuel College. He eventually got citizenship, and then I got my master's, and then I went for my doctoral program up here at SUNY Albany. And so I went from teaching to administration. I became director of several opportunity programs. I was Assistant Vice President for Diversity and Affirmative Action up in Potsdam, SUNY Potsdam. I eventually got divorced, became, you know, single mother, raised my son, went to college, you know, and just progressed from there. But the first half of the book is about my life in Jamaica. And uh, several things happened to me there that made me realize I was not going to live the life of my mother. My mother was happy, but I just was not going to be 
the typical housewife and mother type of thing. I just thought that women shortchanged themselves at a very young age. I just said, look, I am not the marrying type. I'm not the housewife. And I was going to do everything within my power to be able to sustain myself. The problem was we didn't have a lot of money. We, we didn't have the resources. I didn't live, you know, a life of dire poverty, but we didn't have extra money for anything. But what made me come to the realization that I was not going to live the life of a housewife was an experience I had at age 11 at a place owned by my biological father. I wasn't raised by my biological parents. I was raised by my aunt, my mother's sister, and her husband. But at this place called Heart Hill, the book is centered around that. And my experience there set me on a life that led to persevering even when you don't see how you're going to achieve your goal, but just keep on keeping on. And I, that experience there gave me strength. And I think most people would have just succumbed and not bothered. But it, it gave me the realization and the strength to move ahead to be an independent woman and to just know that I was going to take care of myself. And then when my son came along, to take care of him too. I raised my son, and eventually at age 55, my son passed oh. um, from cancer. <laughs> I can still not talk about it without a little bit of choking up, but... He, he was such a good man. He grew up to be a fantastic man. But he inherited bone cancer because his father died from the same exact oh, thing. I'm so sorry. And at age 55, he passed with the same, same diagnosis of bone cancer. But I have known just about everything there is to experience in life. And my son is the inspiration for the book. He kept telling me to write it. He told me even as a child, Mom, write, write these stories you tell me. And so I didn't for the longest time. And then, you know, he kept saying, you have to write it, you have to write it. Unfortunately, the book was published after he passed. And that's one of the things I think about. He would have been so proud and happy yeah. had, he, had he been around to, to see it. But You had titled it Under the Jimbalin Tree. Yes, because it was under the Jimbalin tree that I had an epiphany at age 11 and a half that made me older than my years, I think. And I just understood who I was and where I was going in this world, on this stage that we're all acting in. So, hmm. so I t entitled it that because I made a promise to myself and to God that I was going to be this kind of person and do these kinds of things. And in effect, I think I did that. I think I achieved. And I hope that the book is an inspiration to young people that, you know, if you, if you have a dream, a goal in life, even if you don't see how you're going to do it, even if you have no resources to do it, just keep on keeping on. Just put your nose to the grindstone and take little tiny steps and you'll get there. So I hope it's an inspiration to young people. But I also hope that women who think that they need a man in order to be successful in life, that maybe the book will show them that it doesn't have to be. You can find the love of your life, you can get married, you can do whatever you want, but you can also achieve personal goals 
and you never have to be dependent on anyone but yourself. I hope that that is the takeaway from the book. Well, with your connections to the college, I don't know if you still have connections. Are, are you able to go and you know talk to young people? I'm going to start that. If the book came out in the spring. You know, the colleges are sort of winding down. And in the summertime, most of them have summer programs, et cetera. So I'm now setting up things of that nature for the colleges up here for the fall. So hopefully in the fall, I'm hoping some of them might even put my book on a reading list. And, you know, I will volunteer to go and speak at some of these classes and do book signings. That would be great. All right. And just just quickly, for for those who may not know about this wonderful Jamaican fruit, tell us what a jimbalin is. The jimbalin itself is a tiny, very tangy, sourish fruit. It's tiny like small grapes. And it's not a fruit that is cultivated by anybody and it it, adults don't even bother with eating jimbalins mostly children love it and usually if in my case the tree was very tall i couldn't climb it um but so i used to sit under the jimbalin tree my brothers and i were starving and we would sit under the jimbalin tree and pick up the ones that had fallen to the ground but were still good. And we would, um, you know, bring a bunch of them. And at night, we would be terrified because we were left alone. And we would eat the jimbalins at night while we told stories to each other to calm us in order to sleep. And it was once when my brothers were off, I had two brothers that were with me for that experience, and I was sitting under the tree picking up the jimbalins when it occurred to me that the way we were living was not good, that I knew better than what we were doing, that I had values that had been taught to me that I was ignoring that I needed to straighten up, clean up, and pray that we will get out of this situation. And it was there I made the pact that if I got out of here, what I would do and how I would do it. So I named it Under the Jimbalin Tree because that was my epiphany. Thank you so much. I feel inspired. Oh, thank you. All right. (laughs) Bye-bye. Deborah Ann Masile is living a parent's worst nightmare, but she describes how she's found comfort in her book entitled In the Arms of Angels, The True Story of a Daughter's Love from the Other Side. Now, in your book, you argue that we can maintain contact with our loved ones after they're gone. Yes. Tell me about that. It basically started at my um, my daughter's wake when I heard her her voice and she she said something about um, you know that she didn't look well and thought I was losing it. Of course, I didn't tell anyone, but um, I have a close friend that um, I spoke with her about it uh, that night and come to realize with everything that happened that I could actually hear my daughter. Uh, It was a wonderful, wonderful blessing. And that's how it got me through years of, you know, having lost her. What happened? She went out with um, a bunch of people uh, and overdosed. How old was she? She was 27. She was going to her half-sister's house. Uh, She had just had a baby and um, she was going over to spend the night and help her with the baby. And uh, these people called her, and um, actually, she only knew one person. I don't know if they wanted to meet her or whatever, but she ended up with these people. They picked her up at the house, and um, she never made it to her sisters. So after you felt her at her wake talking to you, then there were other experiences, and and that's what your book's about. Yeah, it's basically... um, 
how she helped me through uh, my grief. It was, uh, it, it took me many years. I, I mean, I'm not over it, but I'm able to handle it now. Uh, before, um, I was just like, a, I, I think I was like just going through the motions. Uh, even in work, I was like kind of like a zombie. Um, and um, she kept speaking to me and say, and talking to me and telling me that she's with me and telling me that she loves me and that I can do this. And she was, you know, uh, there for me. And um, at first, when I didn't realize it was her, she was tapping on the glass on the lamp on my bedstand. And then when I would sit in the kitchen, I have a ceiling fan over the table with lights and she was tapping on that. And I didn't put two and two together. At that time, I wasn't hearing her because I was crying all the time. So I, I couldn't hear her at that time. So she was trying to get my attention. So uh, this was going on probably for about two weeks. And um, I just didn't put two and two together that it was her until I spoke to um, a medium where my daughter was trying to get in touch with her for two weeks. I didn't even know this woman. And um, she told my daughter told her that I need to talk to my mother. You need to get in touch with my mother. And of course, she didn't know who I was until um, a fr my friend um, worked with someone that knew her. And that's how everything went down, how I ended up speaking to my daughter through this medium and um, actually told me that I wasn't nuts, that I could actually hear her. You could hear your daughter. Yes, I still do. And my daughter. Through the medium, she was able to actually speak to you. Yes. The first thing that she told me was, your daughter wants you to know that you're not crazy. You can hear your daughter. I can tell you that um, when my father passed away, my mom, she was speaking to my um, out loud to my dad the night before. And um, she was telling him that she was sorry about some of the things that she said and did to him. I had known nothing about it. And then the next day, I took my mom to the bank. I was waiting outside and my father started speaking to me. And he said, I want you to tell your mom that um, I forgive her and that I love her. So when she came out to the car, I told her, I says, um, I dad just came through to me and he wants you to know that he forgives you and that um, he wants you to know that he loves you. And uh, she says, oh, I just spoke with him last night. I asked him to forgive me for um, some of the things that I said and did. So, yeah, I, I can hear them. And I believe that if you're in tune to it and you believe yourself, you can. Because we all have, it's not just one person or a couple of people that have that. We all have that because we're connected to God and we're connected to one another. So that's the purpose of your book. It is. The purpose is to help people with their grief so they know that their loved ones are still alive, uh, but they're in spirit, but they are around us and um, they want to help us through our grief and um, and God as well. Um he uh, sends his angels at times to help us and lift us up. Are you able to get out and talk about this? I mean, are you, are you able to offer comfort to others in similar situations? Yeah, right now I'm working on my second book. Um, it's um, like a sequel uh, to this book, but it's basically a, a grief workbook. And um what I like to do is do classes with it to help people with their grief. Have you been able to actually do that? Right now, it's once every three months. I'm doing a spiritual healing class. It's not um, geared uh, to uh, grief, but uh, it helps people relax and um, uh, balance themselves. And it, it gives them um, ideas. We give them ideas about how to uh, handle stress in their life. Have you told them about your book? 
I have, yes, and um, I've been posting it a lot on um, Facebook and Instagram, and um, I mean, I, I talk to people uh, about the book. There's also, um, in the city, uh, they do it once a year. It's um, a group that they have. It's called Recover for River, and it's all the people that lost loved ones through substance abuse. Okay. So I plan on trying to do something uh, to get my book out down there uh, to help people if they're interested. So if you really feel this has helped you move forward? It has, yeah. To be honest with you, it took me a while to write it because I had to keep stopping because it's like reliving it all over again. Yeah. Uh, it was tough to get through it. Um, you know, I, I took the time, uh, you know, to... to uh, heal myself and then go back to it. So um, it did take me a little while. But in the meantime, I was also caring for my mom. So it wasn't like I was, I wasn't working at the time I was caring for my mother. So it made it a little easier to write the book. Well, I'm I'm happy that you, you found a way through because grief is so debilitating. Oh, definitely it is. Um, I, I've known some people that lost, um, their child and they haven't gotten through it. They're on medication and um, they can't even function. It's. I think that's the worst pain um, is losing a child than that you can ever experience. Um, you know, you lose your parents and that's tough, but it's not the same pain as when you lose a child. Yeah. I was supposed to be journaling, but I never did. So, um, Everything that was going on with me, I was going to start journaling, but I never did. So, Well, you ended up writing it down anyway, didn't you? I did. Yes, I did. It's good to know that that has brought you some comfort and, you know, maybe it'll bring comfort to others as well. So thank you so much for talking with me today. Yeah, no problem. A psychiatrist for 55 years, Dr. Robert Bellino is here to share his lifetime of experience in his book, B. Control Ability for You. Your Guide to Everything. A Traveler's Guide to Coping with the Universe and All That Is You. Dr. Bellino, why now? Because I wanted to combine all of my understanding that I received in the years that I practiced to try to help people to be less upset, to find uh, meaning, control, and wisdom in their life so that they will feel better and have a modicum of security and serenity, tranquility and peace. That was what I really did as a psychiatrist. You never eliminate it, but you certainly can reduce it. And there are things that can be done as individuals that can do it. And I thought I would tell the people that, at least with my experience. Can you give me an example? Like, what would you say is the most common issue we face? Oh, well, everybody has anxiety and depression, and life is unhappy, and they have trouble with it, trying to cope with it. That's that's a generalization of what kind of problems there are. Now, of course, there are other kind of psychiatric problems that are quite different, but we're talking about the general population. And the general population, we find, is either happy or unhappy to some degree. <laughs> and that can be changed, I believe. And that's what I wrote the book for. Can you give me an example of one way we could deal with depression? Well, you have to, you have to do things. You have to be positive thinking and you have to replace your negative thinking, which is the depression causes one to think negatively. Um, And you have to replace that with positive thinking. And the book I wrote is about positive thinking. It's about how to change your thoughts into something more positive so that you'll have a modicum, as I said before, of serenity, tranquility, and peace. That is reduce the depression. I wish all of us could just eliminate depression this way or that way, but usually we don't. But there's no question that it can be reduced significantly by thinking positively. And this book, is about thinking positively and how to go about it. But it's a journey and it's a practice and that's what has to be done. And I think that that's what the book helps people to think of positive things by looking at positive words and repeating them. 
while you're repeating the positive words, for a moment, the negative kind of thing is reduced or eliminated. And that's what you have to do. You have to find some way to divert your attention away from the unhappiness to a, either average or better happy feelings. And that's a journey. That's the same thing. Again, thinking positively, because one of the things that happens when we get anxious and depressed and fearful and insecure is we don't know what direction to go, where to find that kind of thing. This book is about where to find words and sentences that will help you to deal with, to change the anxiety, the depression, the fear, the worry and concern. So um, chapters like Keep Going Boy, You Catch More Flies with Honey, Nothing is Good or Bad. Is that what you're talking about? These are the phrases. Oh, yes. Yes. I'm, and I use those words only because I wanted to, I didn't want people to think we're writing a deep, uh, intense book that they wouldn't understand. But that's what uh, I wanted them to do, be in the world. And being in the world means you have to keep going. Keep going, boy. That's called the world. <laughs> Strike while the iron's hot. Are there examples in these chapters or are they just words? The words that come in the book after each little chapter are positive and can help people to change the negative. I wish I could say by reading the word one time, uh, everything is hunky-dory. That's not the way it is, but you can find it. So, um, hey, you... That's at the end of one of your chapters, right? Yes. What's that yes. chapter about? Get people's attention to listen to what's being said. And in this case, is really to read the words that come after that. Hey, you. Yes, you. When you think positively, you're going to feel better. Now, that's easy to say. The question is, well, then how in the living daylights do we think positively? How do we get to that point? We do that by reading the words that are after each chapter. You make that part of you. And when that happens, you decrease or you eliminate the bad feelings, the negativity. How do I know when and how to control everything? <laughs> how do I know? You have to have a start. You have to say, wait a minute, something is here that I can use to change it. And I'm going to go there even though I don't feel like going there right now. And I will reiterate again, it's reading those positive words that you can have that will make you change. But getting there is a journey and it's a trial and it's a difficulty, but that can be done. The specific steps are to read the words, read them again and again and understand them. And in the process of understanding them, they will reduce or eliminate the negative feelings. There are, there are hundreds of those words that can be used or little statements that can be very helpful. Some people will pick up some that have meaning particularly for them because everybody's life is different. But as they read through, say, wait, that has... I understand that. That's something good. When they do that, they focus on that, and that changes for a moment their negativity, their depression, their anxiety, their fear, their worry. And if you can do it for a moment, you recognize that you can do it for longer. That's positive thinking, and that's the beginning of us moving ahead. Do you think there's a lot of anxiety over our current state of affairs in America? Oh, my goodness gracious, yes. <laughs> you know, how do we find positivity there? We've got families fighting and neighbors fighting and flags all over the neighborhood. <laughs> like, oh, There's a lot of social media anxiety. It's all in the individual. The individual has to find it him or herself. And you do that by putting positive thoughts positive words into your mind instead of thinking how bad things are, how dark they are, or how painful they are. And that's true. They all are that. But now we got to substitute and we substitute something like brightness and light and joy and admiration and love. We, we use those words to become them, to accept them. So I guess it's like if you say it enough, you'll actually believe it and be it. 
Uh, some of them, yes, ma'am. That's why there are a lot of them. Some of them you will. <laughs> Were like how many sayings do you have in this book? Gee, I like, don't, I don't know. Thousands? I, oh no, not a thousand. Honestly, uh, I don't know. Any advice for people that are listening? They want to write, haven't been able to do it, but they're listening to this podcast to find some advice. Keep going, boy. <laughs> <laughs> that's part. That's part of the book. Keep going, boy. You have to keep. You have to keep trying. You have to have something some tool or tools that you have that will push you in that direction. And of course, the tools that we have in this book are the words and the sentences that are positive. I just finished another book of the same category. It's going to be called Being. But I'm just telling you that because it has nothing to do necessarily with what we're doing right now. But I, uh, I retired and I had to find something to do with everything I knew and, and my involvement with people in the world. So I wrote the first book. And uh, I was a little surprised that the being is so small. I don't know if people are going to like that or not, whatever it is. But it's a very positive book. But the next book is also going to be that same kind of thing, even more intensive, called Being. All right. Well, the book is B, Control Ability for You, Your Guide to Everything, A Traveler's Guide to Coping with the Universe, and All That Is You. And you. Yes, ma'am. You are the universe. I feel better already. Hmm? You are the universe. We are the universe. Yeah, not we. You and me. I'm the universe. You're the universe. You have to say that to yourself. I'm the universe. Because you are. You decide everything that's going on. You're right. I right. don't. They don't. You do. Yeah, you can't change other people, but you can change yourself. Oh, absolutely. And then guess what? You change other people. You change other people by changing yourself. You change the world. We can only hope. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes. Well, it's a journey. It's a journey. And that's why it can't be done one time and say, oh, okay, because it it's not going to work like that. All right. Dr. Bellino, thank you so much for talking to me today. Hey, thank you very much. Floyd Hardy considers himself God's messenger, and in a rewrite of his first published book, he delivers Paradise, God's Third Heaven. How you doing, Floyd? You talk slow for someone from New Jersey. Well, you got to get me started, Floyd. Oh. <laughs> so how long have you been writing? I wrote my first book about... Fifteen years ago, I guess. Uh, why are there 12 gates in heaven? Did you find the answer? Of course. Okay. I was teaching the Bible for 35 years at that time, I guess, and I asked every reverend with 10 years of college, why are there gates in heaven? When you're in heaven, what do you need a gate for? And all they ever told me was, well, when we get there, we'll find out. And so that bugged me. And finally, talking to the Lord, that he led me to the... 21st chapter of Revelations and revealed to me that the gates are there for a reason. Are you a minister? Oh, Lord, no, no. I'm a high school dropout. So what'd you do for a living? I served my country for two years, nine months, and 22 days, peacetime. And then I was hired at a paper mill in Brainerd, Minnesota, and I worked there 19 years when I got caught in the machinery and it wrecked my right arm and hand real bad. They were self-insured, and so they gave me a janitor's job of keeping the basement clean. And I thought I was a rat down there with nobody around to talk to or anything, so I quit. I put up a hog barn and started raising pigs. And after my knees got so bad that I couldn't get a pig in the barn anymore, well, I shipped them all. And then my wife thought I should get a job, so then I was hired at the post office as a substitute mail carrier for about five years, six years, and then I quit that. Were you writing along the way? Oh, yeah. I wrote this book on why there's 12 gates in heaven, and it was a total flop because no one reads the Bible. They don't understand what the Bible says. So then uh, Christian Faith Publishing... I hired them to put the book on the market through Amazon, and the title of it was It's Over. 
that was their idea, which was a flop. But anyway, uh, the book, it's over. I think it sold two copies. I don't know. It doesn't matter. I'm not in it for the money. But anyway, uh, in Second Corinthians, Paul says, I was taken up to the third heaven called paradise. And now, you don't have to be a high school graduate to know that if there's a third heaven, there must be a second heaven, and there must be a first heaven. Duh. So then that put me to work on writing this book, God's Third Heaven, which is what Paul said it was. And this is the history of Revelation chapter 21. In 21, it says that the second heaven is called the New Jerusalem. Okay? And it describes it as 1,400 miles square. That's from where I live all the way to Dallas, Texas, and all the way to Spokane, Washington. It's a pretty big building. And it has 12 gates, three on each wall. And it says in Revelation chapter 21 that those on the outside of this wall can't come in. So then I asked the Lord, well, who's out there? Huh? <laughs> And it said, there are nations. Now, a nation is a group of people with a boundary, right? United States, Canada, Mexico, Germany, all right? Okay. And if there are nations out there, there must be a lot of people, huh? Duh. And so then that put me to work on, well, who's out there? And this is where the book of Paradise come from, because Paradise is the new earth, which is huge, probably 10 times bigger than earth we know now, of people who never heard of Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus says, I am the only way to my Father. No other way. So all those who lived and died before Jesus was resurrected from the grave had no way of going to heaven. They couldn't go because they were sinners. Where'd they go? They went to paradise. Are you getting this information from the Bible? Yes, yes, yes. So you're yes, just taking yes. information that's already in the Bible and you're putting it together so that people will read it. The mistake I made, if you need to understand, is when I wrote the Why Are There Twelve Gates in Heaven, I quoted the Bible and told in the book where to look it up. Okay. All right, go to Corinthians, go to Revelations, whatever. Now, in the new one, that that God told me to write. You, you did a lousy job, Floyd. Do it again. And in this one, Paradise, the Third Heaven, I quote word for word what it says in the Bible. In other words, you don't have to go look it up. In other words, this is what's going to happen or did happen, and here is exactly what it says. The whole book is quote after quote after quote from the Bible. It's not my idea. It's what Jesus taught and what God prophets taught and let's just say I condensed the Bible down to uh, two and a half hours okay and if you want to know what the Bible says read the book <laughs> how did God tell you to write this well I talked to him every morning every evening and all day during the day I've been teaching the Bible for 45 years who do you teach it to Sunday school, meeting in homes. Uh, I go to the jail three days a week to lead uh, Bible study at the jail right now. That's pretty much my last 24 years I've been going to jail. But I have the gift of teaching. The Holy Spirit has given me that. I'm not a preacher. I'm a teacher. I don't know why. I do have a pretty high IQ, I guess. But anyway, I have the ability to analyze sentences to know what they say. And by reading the Bible, see, the Bible is God's Word. Every word in there is 40 authors, but they were all inspired by God to put in there what God wanted them to write. And anyway, this paradise, the third heaven, is what God told me to write. I don't care if you believe that or not, but it's the truth. And when I finished it, I hired Page Publishing. I got their phone number in the middle of the night off in the television. I memorized it and called them, and they have been wonderful. When I got through writing the book, I told God, okay, I'm tired. I'll be 83 in August, okay? 
I'm not going to go to the newspaper. I'm not going to go to the radio. I'm not going to fly here and fly there. You take over. So that's why I'm talking to you right now, okay? Okay. Let me explain something to you that writing this book, I cannot type. I use one finger, one letter at a time. Okay. And I had 11 chapters written and saved when I turned it on and I had nothing and I get my friend a nerd a hate or something wrong with my laptop and he gets all through and he informed me that I had pushed some button on there and did something and it wiped the whole thing out. Oh, he couldn't bring it back. Oh, that's so then, terrible. So that's Satan working on I don't want this published. Well, I just went back to the first tonight. One, one letter at a time, I... I had written it in a book by hand, so now I'm copying it over onto the laptop. But anyway, I finally got it done, and and then I told God that I'm tired. (laughs) All right. You you promote it. He's doing an awesome job, even through you. I don't know what you're going to do with this interview, but uh, you can put in there that uh, God literally said, I want you to rewrite, why are there 12 gates in heaven? And oh, so that's what that's what this book is. Only I quoted the scriptures. When you read the book, you don't need the Bible. You just mm-hmm. read it. And I tell everybody, when you're done reading it, now you know what it says. Now go back and read it again so you understand it. Okay. you got to read it twice. <laughs> okay. All right, Floyd, and, listen, you have a great day. Thank you. Okay, and on <laughs> your weekend with nothing to do, reading, yeah. oh, it takes two, two and a half hours. All right. <laughs> All right. No problem. All right, right. love you and thank you and uh, good luck with whatever you got to do. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. We hope to see you back here every Saturday night at 8 o'clock or listen to our podcast anytime on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, just to name a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.